Hello, welcome to February's Jira Admin for Beginners training session. My name is Alex, and I am very excited to have you on. Before we get started, just a couple of house rules. We are definitely utilizing the chat here on the side. So if you want to have any interaction with the live stream here, make sure that you are leveraging that chat there. I do have someone helping me out. So if you have any questions at any time, please feel free to drop your questions in there. And we're going to be flagging them and taking little breaks here and there between in the, during the live stream and answering those questions on, on your behalf. So definitely a little bit more of an interactive, definitely a little bit more of an interactive section or session. And just make sure that you're leveraging that chat there um, to your availability. Um, and in the meantime, please feel free to drop hello and, and see where you're from. I'm excited to have you all here and I'm excited to jump into this. Now, this talk is all about Jira administration for beginners. And so in the chat, if you're looking for something a little bit more advanced, do please provide that level of feedback. It's really interesting for us to find out where your different skills are at um, and figure out how we can best serve you. Um, but for now, just keep in mind that this will be a beginners. So really, really basic, really, really just designed to help somebody that's a new administrator become a little bit more comfortable with Jira. So with that said, let me share my screen and we're gonna jump into this and get started. So again, any questions in the chat, we are monitoring that. And so we're more than happy to take some time here to answer those questions. So what are we gonna be talking about today? As I mentioned, some basics of Jira Admin. We're gonna briefly, um, if you attended the January session, you know that I spent a little bit more time than I would have liked in projects, but we're gonna briefly talk about projects, then go on to what I like to think of as the most common administrative things that I do every day, day to day as a Jira administrator. So we're gonna be covering issue types, workflows, custom fields, and screens. There is a whole lot more, trust me when I tell you, a lot more to being a Jira administrator, but these right here, I'm gonna give you some fundamentals, some basics so that you have enough skill to be what a lot of people like to say dangerous <laughs> as a Jira admin, but in all honesty, I'm gonna give you just you know some, some good feedback, some good information, uh, to, to give you that confidence that you need as a new Jira administrator. And before we jump into it too far, let me give you a little bit of credibility, who I am. Um, you may recognize me as Dr. Jira on the internet. Um, I do mainly run a YouTube channel separate from the one we're on right now. So right now we are in the Jira live. And so quick shout out, if you haven't subscribed to the channel, this would be a great opportunity to subscribe to the channel. We are trying to get to a thousand subscribers. We're almost there. We're a little under 200 or a little over 200 away from hitting our um, our goal here of 1,000 subscribers. So if you haven't subscribed to the channel, this would be a great, great time to just take a second here, go down to that little red button and smash the subscribe button. Um, but when I'm not on the Jira Life with my partner here in crime, Rodney, the Jira guy, um, I am mainly posting up videos on my main channel, which um, we have linked here in the chat. So that is my main channel. So that is usually where I post my how-to videos and links to everything. If you scan that QR code, uh, that's gonna take you to everything that you need to know um, in order to be able to get onto uh, free trainings that I provide, paid trainings that I provide, and of course, my the Jira Life and the Tech channel. Um, I do have a bachelor's in computer science, master's in computer engineering. So, sorry, no, bachelor's in computer engineering, master's in systems engineering. Who? It's been a while. I come and almost, almost forgot. Um, I mainly come from the defense industry. I've had over seven years of experience in the Atlassian ecosystem and most recently, as of like a week and a half ago, I am officially an Atlassian certified professional. Um, I officially hold the ACP 520. So all about the cloud, cloud administration. So I'm very, very excited to be able to say that on, on camera. This is the first time that um, I publicly acknowledged it here. So again, feel free to check out those resources, smash the subscribe button, and let's jump into the material. All right, so we're going to kick things off and I am going to be in Jira. So this is a, if you haven't attended a training session of these before, um, I don't like PowerPoint. I, I'm not a huge fan. So we're going to just give you just enough, just enough information, just enough notes uh, for you to, to have, you know, just the basis of what we're talking about, a foundation. And then we're going to jump straight into the tool and we're going to be doing everything in the tool. Um, but before we do that, uh, I want to make sure we establish some baselines here. And so we're going to be talking about Jira administration and specifically in the cloud. So this is Jira admin. Um, I, I don't have access to data center versions of Jira, but I do have access to the cloud. So we're gonna be focusing on the cloud. 
and a little bit more background. So it's not just all Jira administration. We're going to be focusing on a very specific type of administration. This is for Jira software. So if you don't know, there's five different versions of Jira. Uh, Jira software, Jira service management, Jira product discovery, Jira work management, and Jira align. Uh, the first four Jira, the, the first four Juras, they share a common administrative model. So what I'm going to teach you today with respect to issue types and workflows and screens and fields, all of that can be leveraged across the different Juras. And, but for just simplicity's sake, we're going to be focusing on software-based company managed projects. And the reason that is, is because uh, that is where you are basically as an administrator able to get all the power out of Jira. Now, again, there's different product types, there's different project templates like these team managed ones, but those those are a lot more limited. They're a lot more re restrictive is a strong word, but they're just not as admin friendly because it's designed to not be that way, right? Team managed projects at last can design them so that anybody without any background in your administration has the opportunity and the ability to modify their projects. And as such, you have a limited amount of customizations that you can do in order to not get into too much trouble. But because you're a Jira admin, or at least an aspiring Jira admin, company manage is where it's at. With company manage, it's all, all rules are off, traction controls off, and you have the ability to to do all the Jira administration in these projects. So as such, we're going to be focusing on that. And the other thing that I want to talk about is a lot of this, uh, and, and another reason, if you're not a, a fan of company managed projects, one of the reasons why I like to do it is, is with respect to organizations, companies that leverage these tools, um, when you're in a company managed project, you can create templates of your configurations. And so you're not having to snowflake all these different answers, which can be very uh, taxing and a lot of overhead on a Jira administrator. So as a best practice, I'm going to be uh, focusing on these company managed projects so that you can also be set up for some success here and be able to um, be able to, to create these templates that then can be reused. And that way you minimize the burden as a Jira administrator. So can't do that in team managed projects, unfortunately, but company managed is where it's at. So with that said, uh, let's talk about issue types and then we'll jump right into, um, into Jira. Okay, so let's talk about issue types. So we're gonna be focusing on four main things. We're gonna talk hierarchies, epics, standard issue types, and subtask issue types. And with that said, we're out of PowerPoint and straight into, into Jira. So again, drop any questions. I am being told here 800 subscribers. So thank you to everybody that subscribed. It is not too late. Help us get to a thousand. We're almost there. Um, and and uh, we're excited to excited to have you as a as a fan of the channel. All right, so here's the Jira interface. I'm sure if you're a Jira admin, hopefully if you're in this class, you've seen Jira before. If not, welcome. This is Jira. As an administrator, there's a lot of stuff that you do at the project level. This is while basic, not in scope for this course. We're going to be focusing on over here on the right side. And let me zoom in because I do believe from previous sessions I have feedback that my 5K monitor might not be the easiest on your eyes. And so we're going to be over here on the little gear. And if you're a Jira admin, get really, really accustomed to this little gear. This gear is your portal to everything Jira administration. So become very comfortable and very familiar with what happens beneath this gear. And so for this session, we're mainly going to be focusing on this issue section. But as you can see, there's a lot of other things, especially when respect to like user management and billing and and project management and, and system management, right? But today we're gonna to be focusing on issues because I would say 80% of what I do day in and day out as a Jira admin happens in one of these screens here. It's happening in a, in a configuration here. So um, we, we're gonna be focusing on that. So as you can see here, the very first configuration is issue type. So naturally we're gonna be focusing a little bit on issue types and let's talk about hierarchy. And I almost feel like Atlassian should swap these out because as you're going to learn, and as I'm going to teach you in a second, the hierarchy is a setting that is great for you to know about, but not always the most critical thing to do right out of the gate. Um, but I just like, for my OCD, <laughs> I like to start top down and work my way down, but I'm going to be toggling between this hierarchy and the issue types um, down below. So what is an issue type hierarchy? So out of the box, Jira gives you a triple layer hierarchy where you have your epics, you have your stories or what they call standard issue types. And then you have your subtasks or what Atlassian calls subtask issue types. And that out of the box, whether you're on the free plan, the standard plan, or even premium or enterprise, 
that is the default triple layer hierarchy that you get out of the box, which is really, really good. Um, it works for a lot of teams. And naturally, it aligns with Agile methodology. So again, this is not a course on Agile, but uh, these issue types here that we have naturally align with that. Now, as an administrator, and specifically when you're on the premium enterprise plan, which is where you really want to be, not a, I don't work for Atlassian. I don't get sponsored by Atlassian to tell you this. But if you want the full power of Atlassian or of your Jira products, premium and enterprise is where it's going to be. Um, and so one of the cool things that you get with that is you get this ability to add issue types above epics. And so one thing that you should know is that you as an admin, one, you can add more issue types. You don't have to stick to just the epics and the stories and the tasks and the bugs and the subtasks. Those are the basics. Those are what it ships with. But you have the creative freedom to create whatever issue types you and your company need. And we'll talk about that in a second. But here in the hierarchy, you're able to manipulate the order. Now, over the last year, year and a half, Atlassian has been going through great efforts to make this a lot more friendlier and a lot more usable. And I think they're almost there. Um, but we essentially can create issue types above the epic. And, and this hierarchy is where you're going to go and set that up. So Atlassian has this concept of a parent and a child. And so uh, the subtask is the child is the smallest child. Your stories are the parents. The epic is the parent of the story. And then whatever you want, I call mine initiative, but whatever you want, you can have issue types or parents above the epic. And you can go up as high as you want. And I haven't tried it just yet. I wouldn't try it. I think this is more of an advanced thing. But you definitely do also have the ability to rename your epics. This is a newer functionality that, again, Atlassian has been working on for the last year, year and a half. And I'm excited to to hopefully one day very, I, I'm, I'm, I have scars because I tried it when it was in beta. It didn't work out very well. And so I'm very hesitant to try it out. But I'm excited to uh, give this another go. And, and a lot of companies that follow like the safe methodologies as an administrator, one of your duties is to change all this hierarchy to align with your company strategy. And if your company is a safe organization, scaled agile framework, then coming in here is definitely something you should be aware of and know how to do so that you can align yourself with with your uh, safe methodologies. Now, again, um, premium and enterprise only. So that's essentially what's happening here um, at this hierarchy level here. So how do we get to the current screen? Um, so it is from the gear and we go to issues. When you go to issues, you naturally land on all these settings over here and the issue type hierarchy uh, uh, is the very, very first one. So this is the first setting that is available. Now, again, this, I, I don't like starting there, but I'm there because this is top to bottom my OCD, but really the beginners where you really care where you want to be at is in this issue types here. So this issue type section here is where you're allowed to basically create whatever issue type you want. Okay. And you have the ability to create anything that is creative or, or that your company needs. And it's really easy to add an issue type. Um, there's two levels or two layers of issue types. There's the standard ones, which we'll talk about uh, right now. And then there's a subtask type, which we'll talk about in a minute. And to create an issue type, it's really, really easy. All you got to do is click on this big blue button. You do need to be a site admin. You need to be a Jira admin, or you need to be an administrator or an org admin to be able to do these things. If you're not one of those four things, then you're going to have a really, really hard time because guess what? You're not even going to be able to get to this screen. So Robin stuff, if you're not seeing this at all, most likely you're not an admin. And so if you are the proper admin, though, you will be able to get here um, because it's available to all admins. But anyway, so to add an issue type, all you, you got to do is click on that blue button. You're going to give it a name. And so you can name this literally whatever you want. My recommendation to be nice to future self is align your issue types with something strategic, right? Something that makes sense, whether you're maybe a safe organization, maybe you're a, maybe you're following a different methodology. You want to make sure that your issue types make sense, right? You wouldn't want to call it like, like trash. Like this would not be a good name for an issue type. Maybe, maybe not. But maybe you want to have, uh, maybe you're tracking an asset. Maybe you're tracking uh, some, some defect, right? So a defect is a good one because defect's not a, a, a default one. But you can basically name it whatever you want. I'm going to call it a defect. I don't know if I have one already. I should have checked. Um, but I'm just going to call it that. Descriptions are optional. Nobody ever gets to see what these descriptions are. So this is really more for you and your admins to help yourselves out. But you can put in whatever you want here. And then on the type, 
leave it to zero. When you do something else, something that is not zero, it's going to create it as a subtask type, as you can see here. And most of the time, you don't want it to be a subtask type. And the reason that is, is because when you create a subtask type, that um, issue type will not be visible in the create button. Subtask type can only be created from within an existing issue. And so you will never see it in the drop down from the create button. So most of the time, folks want the standard one. So this is the one that you want. And I'm just going to click on add. Now, once you do that, at last, it does something that I don't like a whole lot. <laughs> and that is, it gives you a gray icon. And every time that I hit the create button or the add issue type button here, as you can see by my initiative, you will get this very bland looking square. And so what you should do next is go in and then edit. So I'm going to go back into my defect. I'm going to click on these ellipses, click on edit. And now I am going to select my avatar and you can upload your avatar to be whatever you want, or you can pick from one of these items. And so from my defect, I'm just going to put this little pulse thing because maybe we're alive, maybe we're not. And I'll hit update. And I wish that at last thing when I'm adding the issue type, I can pick the avatar here, but it is a two-step process. And you want to be careful because if you're not right, if you create a lot of issue types, you're going to have a lot of gray squares. And the more issue types you have, the more confusing it gets to your end user. Your end user, believe it or not, they do get accustomed to having this little special icon, right? They start in their mind associating the issue type with the picture. And if all your issue types are just gray boxes, it's going to be really, really confusing. So make sure you come in as a pro tip and do that second step. So that's how we add issue types. Um, adding subtasks, so I'm going to skip a little bit. Adding the subtask is basically the exact same thing. We click on this add subtask over here. But notice that this time I'm not being asked whether I want to do a le level zero or level one. It's automatically going to be that level one. And this can be anything you want. I'm just going to call something called the risk. And when I click add, um, it's going to be in there. Now, this icon as well is going to have this default icon for a subtask. You are allowed to edit it, come in, change your avatar to be whatever you want. Um, again, pick something that, um, that makes sense or upload your own picture. But I always try to diversify it because again, having a lot of the same uh, colors or icons is going to confuse your team. So that's issue types. That's the issue type hierarchy. And that's a subtask. Now let's talk about schemes. So what exactly is a scheme? So schemes are very powerful, very important thing in Jira because they, they exist in a lot of different places. And think of a scheme like a bucket, okay? And in your bucket, you're going to put things into it. In this particular case, this bucket is to put issue types in there. Now, the reason we want to do this is because when we go to our projects, right? So when we're when our users are using our Jira projects, we can control as an administrator which issue types are available and which ones are not. And so this is the pool, right? This list of issue types is all the issue types that exist in this particular Jira. But your projects don't have to use all of these. You get to control which ones show up and which ones don't show up. And you do that at the project level. There's a couple of different ways to do that. Um, but the way I usually do it is I go to our projects. So I'm going to go to this one right here. And I can go over here to the project settings. And once I'm in the project settings, I can go to the types. And once I'm here, you can see I have issue types that are in this project. But I have an actions button up here that allows me to edit them. And when I do that, I can control, these are all the ones that are available here on the right, I can add whatever I want. Maybe I want an improvement, maybe I want my risk that I just created, maybe I want that defect that I also just made. And when I hit save, right, so now that they're in here, when I hit save, those issue types are now associated to this particular project. And all that means is when my user goes and hits the create button in this dropdown, I now see those, those issue types that I just dragged in, OK? Now, imagine you have to do this for 20 projects. Well, you're going to get a little bit of carpal tunnel, right, doing the same activity that I just did over and over and over and over and over and over, right, 20 times. And so the schemes allow us, especially, again, when we're in these company-managed projects, it allows us to basically say, hey, this bucket with all these issue types that are in there already, you get to use it and you get to use it. And so you're just doing pointers. You're just pointing to that same bucket and we can at scale change the issue types that are available. We can give 
a different project, a new project or an existing project, the same bucket of issue types um, to anybody that wants them. And so my job now as a Jira admin becomes a lot easier. As an end user, you lose some control because guess what? If I ever want to add a new issue type, I have to add it to everybody. So there's some pros and some cons, but that's what essentially the schemes do, right? The schemes is just a bucket. It can be one-on-one. So if I go back into my, my issues over here and I go to my schemes, you'll notice that each project over here, this is the abbreviation, this is the key. So every single project, when I create a brand new project in Jira, it's gonna get its own scheme. Alternatively, you could you can share them, right? So you can see that each one of these has like a one-to-one -one relationship. This project is for this scheme. This project gets this scheme. But every once in a while, right, depending on how you do your configurations, let me see if I can find an example. I might not have one in this particular instance. But every once in a while, you can basically add in another project. And then that means that two projects or many projects are going to share that same scheme. And trust me when I tell you, again, a little bit more of an advanced topic, but this is something you want to be thinking about because it will help you scale and it will help your job as a Jira administrator not be as burdensome because you don't have to go do unique configurations for 20, 30, 40. Maybe you have 200 projects, right? I, I work with teams with 250 Jira projects and doing the same activity 250 times is not something I wake up in the morning excited to do. <laughs> so the schemes is what's going to help you. So we're going to take a little second break here to... Um, check out and see if there's any questions that are start or that I need to be answering. I'm not seeing anything on the start section. So, oh, wait, there's starts. There we go, start is over here. So we have a standard, uh, as a standard user, no, you will need to get an admin to assist you with that. Yeah, so if you're not an administrator, everything that we're talking about here, you are going to have a really, really hard time, right? It's You have to be a Jira administrator in order to be able to do this as the name implies. And so you need to talk to a Jira admin. Um, fortunately, the person who created the Jira for your company, by default, they're the Jira admin. Um, but I'm sure most people are going to be in a situation where that's not going to be the case. Uh, so just talk to whoever, <laughs> whoever gave you your Jira project, they might be the Jira admin. So you do need to be a Jira admin to do this. Uh, can a standard user, for example, Scrum Master or Agile Coach create an issue type above the Epic? Uh, if you're in premium, no. Well, hold up. Let me explain. So if you're, this above the Epic functionality only exists for premium subscribers and enterprise subscribers, okay? Number two, the administrator needs to come in and configure the hierarchy. They have to come in and set this all up. Once it's set up, then any scrum master or whatever it was, project manager, they can come in and hit the create button and they can create the initiatives. They can create whatever they want above the, the Epic. But it needs to be configured once. Another thing for you to note is that this configuration is global. So if, if one team wants the initiative to be the issue type above the Epic, guess what? All the teams have to have the initiative above the Epic. You can't, one team can't have one set and another team cannot have another set. There is no scheme here. And so everybody, everybody's got to follow the same rules. A uh, question here is, um, oops, oops. is it issue types that determines to create a new project? Uh, no, not necessarily. I think issue types are just work. It's the way to capture different types of work. My When we create projects in Jira, uh, at least the recommendation that I always give my admins is you try to do it like department-based or team-based or project-based or product-based. And so you're organizing because your Jira project is long living and it's supposed to track all types of work. And usually, let's just say that we do it for a team. Well, your team is going to be the ones that are going to be creating stories and they're going to be creating tasks. Hold up. Give me a second here. They're going to be creating tasks and they're going to be creating stories and epics, right? And so you wouldn't want a Jira project per issue type. So that, that would not be um, something to do. Uh, can you create a level below the Epic feature? So as of right now, this is what I was talking about earlier. So you cannot, you are not able to stick something between the Epic and the story today, but you are now able to rename the Epic to be a feature. And so now you would have to essentially create a new Epic and put that above your feature. So that is something that at last is rolling out. Like I said, I tried it maybe six months ago, nine months ago when it was in beta. 
don't ever do a beta in production is what I learned. If you take anything away from this class is don't ever do betas <laughs> uh, in production. Always do them in a sandbox. But try it out. I am told by good sources that this is available now that you can actually rename it that things will work well. But I'm just too scared to try it because mainly because of the scars that I have and the and the bad <laughs> bad memories that I have. So Jolie, try it at your own um, peril here. Uh, Sven, why aren't initiatives displayed on the timeline? It only shows epics and stories. Great, great um, observation here. I'll answer this question, then we're going to keep on going with the material here. So when you're in the timeline, this is the basic timeline. It is called the basic timeline for a reason, and that is because um, it's basic. <laughs> so the free and standard, and premium for that matter, and enterprise for that matter, all of them get this basic timeline. But this timeline is designed to be at the epic and the story only. You don't even get to see that subtask either. So this timeline is only going to show you those two levels, the epic level and the story task bug level. And that's it. If you want to see the whole hierarchy from the initiative or the theme, right, whatever, from tip from end to end, then you need to be on the premium and you need to sign up for what's called uh, the advanced roadmap or what we like to call in the business the JAR, the JIRA Advanced Roadmap. And this one specifically for Nikki, if you're watching the replays. Um, the JIRA Advanced Roadmap or the JAR, which I hope is a, a name that, that, that um, catches on, is a premium and enterprise-only feature. But this JAR will give you that full hierarchy. It'll give you the visibility from the top to the bottom. Um, yes, and Ronnie, we are, we're, JAR is going to be a thing. We're, we're going to make it a thing. <laughs> All right. So that is, uh, let me see, Luca's got a quick question here, and then we're going to continue um, going with, um, we, yes, me, I'm going to make JAR a thing. All right, what about change hierarchy? Epic 4, Story 3, Feature 2, talk, Task 1. That is a good question. I don't think that we can do that. Um, I don't think yet. I, I know that at last is building flexibility, but I don't, I have to try it out, Luca. I haven't tried this. So let me try it. Maybe maybe if you come back in March, we'll have an answer for you or or in the I'll see if I can do it in the replay after. Maybe I can do a separate video. But as, I, as far as I know, you can rename these levels, but things things are still that I've seen things are still not well polished at the epic below. But epic above, we're getting better. Uh, Rohan says is safe hierarchy in safe. Yeah. So epic feature start right. So that's. That's why Atlassian, again, is making these changes to, to allow you to create this type of hierarchy. All right, <clears throat> let's uh, let's continue. So the next thing, right? So now that we talked about issue types, let's talk about workflows. So the workflows is the next big thing that you as an administrator are going to be focused in and utilizing a lot. In fact, if I'm not doing issue types, the next big thing that I'm doing is workflows. Like, so I kind of put these in the order that I typically do a lot of my requests for. So we're gonna talk about statuses the allow all transitions, talk about transitions, board columns, uh, workflows by issue types, and then the workflow scheme. So let's jump into Jira here and as we're going to change gears a little bit. So again, back to the gear, because that gear as a Jira admin, you're going to be very, very, um, very well known to that gear. And this time we're going to leave the issue type section and we're going to go down to workflows. And inside the workflow, I'm just simply going to click on this add workflow and create a new workflow. And so I'm, all I did was hit that blue button, create a new one. I'm going to give it a, a Feb 2024 workflow demo. And I'm going to hit the create button here. <coughs> and once I create the create button, I'm presented with a blank canvas. And so if you've never done any workflow configurations before, uh, welcome. This is, again, one of my favorite things to do in Jira. This is one of the more popular things to do in Jira as an admin. And that is to modify workflows. These are the statuses that your end users end up using to actually leverage and utilize the Jira tool, right? And so these are these things where like you have like in progress, in development, peer review, code review, NQA, UAT, the ready for production, deployed, right? Like all these different lingos and statuses and, and pipelines that your teams leverage to get from an idea to your, you know, to your customer, this is what's happening um, in, in with respect to workflows, right? And so as a Jira admin, Making workflows is something that you are going to become very accustomed to, right? Now, I'm going to get a little, uh, these are my opinions, right? This is how I teach it. This is how I configure it. Um, we have a couple of other Jira admins in the room, specifically my my partner in crime, Mr. Rodney, uh, the Jira guy, Nissan. So 
he may or may not in the chat have a different opinion, but uh, let's talk about statuses first. So statuses to me is a noun, right? So these should be um, things that exist or maybe not even a noun, but they should be not, I'm trying to find the right words now. They should be a, a, a very explicit, almost like a noun type of thing, right? You're in QA, you're in progress, you're in development, you are in something, right? Like you are, you exist in one state, right? You're not in movement. You're not doing, you're not going to somewhere else. That's what the transition is for, right? And so you are allowed to leverage any existing status. So anytime that a that a new status is created, it gets registered and it gets saved. And so you, you're able to reuse any status you want. So like, for example, I can bring in progress. I can click add. And I have just brought in my in progress status. Now, if a status doesn't exist, you have uh, the ability to basically make up your own status. So this is like a new status. And you'll see that you have this new status, and then in parentheses, you have new status. <laughs> it, this new status always shows you, right? New thing will always show you new status because this basically means that this status does not exist in your environment and you're about to create a brand new status. And so if you do go that route, a couple of considerations, be very careful, always check, always check that you have uh, a, a status already, right? Because if you don't, right, if I were to do like in progress, and two, right? And I hit enter, I'm going to create a brand new in progress, or maybe I'm going to do like in progresses, right? I'm creating new statuses that are very similar. And all it does is add confusion and it becomes a nightmare to maintain these 10, 20, 30 years from now. And so you want to do a little bit of due diligence as an admin and you want to, you want to minimize duplicative efforts whenever possible. So I always recommend Double check first before you add a completely new status. Make sure that that status doesn't already exist because then you end up with things like this where you have canceled with one L and canceled with two L's. And some teams are going to use the one with two L's. Some teams are going to use the ones with one L. And then your teams get confused. And so this is a this is a great classic example of why you should do a little bit of just homework before you just go crazy and make statuses, right? Because you, you can end up with very confusing items like this. Tip number two, as a Jira admin, and probably the hardest part in my opinion, is that when you talk with a scrum master or a project manager or anybody in your company, they're going to want you to do anything and everything, right? And so they may have a great idea. It's not always the best idea. And so I think the hardest part about being a Jira admin, especially when you're the beginner, right, is you, you're kind of peer pressured into always just doing what the requirements are. As a Jira admin, you want to be careful, right? Because this is your domain. This is your, your, your area of expertise. Even if you're new, this will become your area of expertise. And you don't want to create clutter. You don't want to create a mess. And maybe at the very beginning, it's easy for you to just go, oh, I'm just going to add, 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 add. But again, six months, maybe a year, maybe two years from now, you're just going to have an unmanageable mess. And then you got to pay a lot of money to get a partner to come in and help you fix your Juras, right? And so be nice to be nice to yourself and um, and kind of just be careful, right? Just just think about it, right? Does it make sense to have a status called canceled and another one called canceled with two L's, right? Like obviously spelling is important, but and this is probably this is just an example, right? But I've seen this all too often where we have like completed and then we have completing, right? It's like, well, why would we have one, right? So push back a little bit on your teams and kind of ask them like, hey, we have this existing one uh, in progress, right? Like uh, in development is a, a popular one that I get, right? Teams want one that says in development. Well, what is in development if not work that's in progress, right? And so this is again where you can push back a little bit um, to not do that. But anyways, so I showed you how to add a status, the new status that's already existing, but let me show you what happens when you add a brand new status. So I'm gonna do in development because this is a brand new status that doesn't exist. And so you do need to click on it or hit enter, and then it's gonna register, okay? It's gonna register inside of Jira, and then you can now click the add button. And when you do that, you get this pop-up that basically says, okay, so here's the name. What category should it be? And you only have three categories. So you either have work that has, is standing still to do, you have work in motion, in progress, or you have work that has come to a rest done. 
And so most of the time, though, uh, my status are either going to be to do or in progress. And that's it. So then I hit, can click the create button and this status now exists. So that's how we add statuses. Now, transitions, there's a couple of different things for transitions. There's a massive polarization. <laughs> I don't even know the right word. There's a big debate on the internet, right? Um, within the Alaskan community. Um, usually when I talk to your admins, this is probably where we, we usually have difference of opinions, right? And that is, should you allow this status to transition to any other status? And so you may have noticed when I was adding a status over here that there's this checkbox that I completely jumped over, right? And I did it intentionally. And when you do select this checkbox, and it's over here as well. So when you select this checkbox, look at what happens to your status. You get this arrow that says all. And what this arrow means is that when you are in this progress, you can transition to any other status that also has this arrow uh, or, or any arrow for that matter, right? Um, so, so I need to do a couple more so it makes a little bit more sense. So something like this would be a common basic workflow where if I am in an open state, when I hit create, I'm going to be in open. Then from open, I can transition to in progress or I can transition to in development. Because of these arrows, I'm able to go from any status to any other status. This requires your team to be very, very disciplined. Because when I add the status of done, and I click the same checkbox, my team can officially go from open to done like that in a snap of a finger and completely bypass all the development. <laughs> and um, that's not always a good thing, right? So what happened then, so teams are like, okay, hold up. This was too much, too much freedom. My team can obviously not handle that. So you just go in here, deselect these items, get rid of them, right? You're like, okay, so we're not going to do that. That was not a good idea. And so what you end up then doing is explicitly calling out a transition. So what that means is you're able to hover your mouse and hopefully you can see my screen here. You can click on this circle here and you can drag and drop and bring it to the next transition. And now I can create the verb, the action, start work right? Do something. You're, you're taking an action. And now I've created a transition from this status to the other. And you do it. I'm going to move this in development because it's redundant. And then you do it to the next one, right? Like work complete. And this is how we add these, these transitions. Now, the good thing about this is that now your team can't go from open to done because there's no line that goes from open to done. So they have to go to in progress. And from in progress, then they have to go to done, right? But this presents a couple of different problems, right? Like, well, now you added essentially steps in your process that have to be followed. And, and if you don't have a good workflow, well, now you have to go through all the steps. So if you have 20 steps, you're going to be going there for a while, right? But the other bad thing is that if you make a mistake, unless you explicitly make a path back, right, uh, back to open, unless you actually have an arrow that goes back, then you can't go back. <laughs> and so you each of these needs a back arrow. So again, if right here, it's easy. But if you have 20, 30 different statuses, it's going to look like a uh, Etch-a-Sketch from back in the day, right? It's going to look really messy, really hard to understand. So again, be nice to yourself. Kiss. Keep it simple. Less is always more when it comes to workflows, okay? And so we'll leave it at that. <laughs> okay, so that's that's essentially how you we add statuses, and this is how we add transitions. Um, let me see what else do I want to tell you. So that is the okay. So that covered that. So now that we have these uh, statuses here, right? I think there was a question. Okay, so now that we did this, uh, what what? How do we get it onto the board, right? So in your projects, and I'm just gonna go to this project over here. When you Modify your workflow when you add new statuses, and I'm going to do it to this one because I already have new statuses in this one. I'm able to go in again in your project on your board. It's a two step process, right? Because it's adding the statuses one to the workflow, and number two, you have to make it visible to the user. And so you come into their board, you hit this configure board here, and you're going to be greeted with this ability to modify columns. And in here, if you scroll down, and I got to scroll down a little bit more this way. Okay, maybe I'm zoomed in too much. I'm going to zoom out a little bit, right? But as you can see here, these are the columns and these rectangles right here correspond to a status in the workflow. So you, after you create those statuses, they're going to show up over here. So your statuses are going to be like over here on the side and you have to create these columns and you create the column by simply going over here to this plus button 
and creating a column. And if you name it the same, it's going to automatically pop it in for you like that. And all you got to do is just make sure that all your unmapped statuses end up in a column. And there's no save button here. You just hit back to board. And your end result is that you're going to have uh, your columns. And now your users can move the story across the board. And so this is a two-step. Now, the users don't have to do it this way. They also do have the option to open it, hit the drop down, and move up and down. Um, as you can see, I didn't create a transition to go back. So I can't go back. I'm at the end. If you look at the workflow, right? It's a one-way street, right? Other than this in review. Um, so this is kind of something for you to consider there. But that is um, how we do the uh, board columns. Now, a couple of other things that I want to call out here before we go into the next topic, and I'm going to stick in here. Um, when you're looking at a project and you go to the project settings of a project, all the workflows, at least out of the box, all the sorry, all the issue types out of the box will be associated to the same workflow. It doesn't have to be this way. You do have the ability to um, edit this and make a workflow for just the bug or just the task. And so again, this is a little bit more advanced, but just wanted to throw a quick shout out that you do have the ability to add multiple workflows to one or many issue types. And so again, this is the default where it's one to many, but you can do like one to one, one to two, one to three, whatever you want. So know that that is possible. Every issue type can have its own workflow. Again, a little bit more of an advanced topic, but I wanted to call it out there. And then the last thing that I want to talk about is if you go back over here to the gear and you go to issues, right? We were doing the workflow right now. But the other thing that you should be aware of is the schemes, right? So very similar to the issue type schemes, um, this is your ability to essentially create a bucket and put those workflows in there. And very similar to the issue types, right? That means that you can share it with other projects. And that just means that you, you just create this bucket that you can reuse or just, you know, just have a neat bucket of schemes. So everything is always in a scheme. It could be one-to-one, -one, right? Every As you can see here, the when you create a brand new project, you get one workflow scheme one workflow and one project. So it's all one-to-one, -one, but as an advanced user, you can always change all of that. And that's usually why you gotta, you gotta increase your Jira skills to be able to comprehend that stuff. So let me know if that's if stuff that's interesting to you, because we can definitely address that in a future um, training here. So a couple of questions here, because we're gonna transition over to uh, custom fields and we'll talk about screens in the last 15 minutes and we'll end this. I do have a hard stop here, folks, in about 15 minutes. So I wanna definitely make sure um, we get to these questions. So uh, Ronnie is just poking, probing the bear here. So what happens if you rename a status? Um, <laughs> jokingly, I tell people that I fire them. Uh, but renaming a status is a big no-no. You should never, ever, ever in a million years, uh, if you can prevent it, right? If you can avoid doing this, don't ever go into a workflow. I'm just going to randomly pick one here. Don't go into a workflow and like rename in development, right? Like if you click on this, you have an edit pencil, you have the ability to to rename this, right? You can just call it development. And this is fine. You, you're not going to complain. It's not going to yell at you. But what you just did is you just changed that for everybody. So everybody that, that had in their filters or in their searches or in their dashboards or anywhere else that they were referencing in development, all your um, automation rules, all of those just broke because you just uh, changed the status of something, right? So don't ever rename, in my opinion, right? You always want to go in and create a new status and then just sunset the old status. So that is my, the, or you got you You must have been in our 24 hour live stream to get the joke. All right, uh, is there an overview status outside of the workflow editor to check what's already available? Yes. So on the left hand side, you can scroll all the way down to statuses here under issue attributes. And this will show you all the statuses that are available, what category they are and how many workflows are associated to. And this is critical because if you ever wanna delete a status, it cannot be associated to any workflow. And so it, like none of these I'd be able to delete uh, except this one right here, because this one is not associated to a workflow and thus I can delete it. So you need to use this in order to delete. Now, again, I'm a little bit more of an advanced topic, so I won't spend too much time, but that's that. Uh, what happens if you don't have a status in a column on a board? Nothing happens. So, oh, wait. I'm reading that incorrectly. So in your board, so let me just quickly go to back to a board and read this correctly. Every column must have a status, okay? You cannot have an empty column. So this is illegal. This is totally, totally illegal, okay? 
But this is completely legal. You can have unmapped statuses on the side. You, they don't all have to be on a column. Okay. This is also legal. You can have multiple statuses in one column. So the only illegal thing that you can't do is create an empty uh, column. This is illegal. You, you have to bring in something. Like it won't let you. Uh, can you move an issue from one workflow to another sub workflow to avoid the spaghetti? There is no concept of a sub workflow, so you have to keep it simple. Um, that's the the comment there. Okay, so let's pick it up here, and we got less than fifteen minutes, and so we're going to talk about custom fields and screens. I'm just going to combine them both, and we'll do this for the next um, ten minutes or so, and then we'll we'll wrap things up. Okay. So custom fields. So going back to the gear here on the right, going to issues, going over to custom fields. This, again, if I'm not doing issue types and if I'm not doing workflows, then I'm adding new fields. That's essentially what I'm doing on a day-to-day -day basis. This is what I charge people to do, right? Like this is this is how I make my livelihood, okay? And so the custom fields, uh, an interesting area, very similar to the advice that I've given you. You want to be careful. Um Again, if your your end user, your scrum masters, your project managers, product managers, managers, anybody, right? They're gonna ask you for some dumb stuff sometimes. <laughs> and as an admin, I'm 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 echoing this again. The hardest part about being a Jira admin is not the technical part; it's the saying no to requests that are gonna hurt not only you as an admin but the organization and and the bigger scheme of, scheme of things, right? And so I can make, if I wanted to, right? If I wanted to be careless, I can make a, a, a custom field for everything and anything. It doesn't matter at the end of the day, right? But when you care about this stuff, when when you bleed Jura admin like like Ronnie and I do, this hurts a little bit, right? Having having a bigger scream of f things, yeah. So so you um you want to be careful, right? You just wanna you want to make sure that you're being methodical about this, right? Being very, being very prescriptive. You just don't want to create for the sake of sake of creating. But how do you create custom fields? And what is a custom field? Well, first of all, let me explain to you what a field is. So I'm gonna go into a project, open up an issue, and everything you see here—the description, the summary, the assignee, the reporter—all of these items here are what's called a field. Okay, and a field is basically where your users are gonna put data in it. And so naturally, your teams are going to want to customize the information they capture, right? Depending on whatever use case your team has. And so in here, you can create a custom field for pretty much whatever you want. So you come in here, you're going to hit the blue create custom field, and then you're presented with the options. These are the types of fields that you can make. And so you can have a checkbox. I don't recommend it. You can have a date picker. I like this one. You can have a date time picker. I don't recommend this one because very few people actually use the time component. They mainly just pick the date. Okay. We have labels, number fields, uh, paragraphs, radio buttons, uh, cascading can only be two levels, um, multiple choice, single choice, short text box, URL, user picker. And if you click on advanced, you get other ones over here. So obviously beginner's course, we're going to stay away from advanced. The most common ones that I do Day picker is very, very common. Paragraph, very, very common. Select list single choice. This I can say if I if I've made maybe like, I can honestly say I probably made like 3,000 custom fields in my career. I would say 2,500 of them have been the select list single choice. <laughs> so this is probably the most common and at least that I get to do day to day. And then there's a the short text box, very common one too. So let's just pick select list because again, that's the one I mainly pick or have to create, you hit next, and then you're gonna give it a name. So super awesome field. And then you give your options, or your options are gonna be your values, like thing one, thing two, thing three, right? And once you're done, you hit create, and that's it. <laughs> you just made a custom field. Uh, the Really the hard part is, when you're working as a Jira admin, you gotta talk to your, to your customer, to your end user, and go, hey, what kind of information are you gonna wanna pick in here? Do you want it a text box? Do you want a small text box? Do you want it to be a drop down? Do you want it to be a multiple choice drop down? Right? Those are the conversations you have to have when somebody asks for something, um, and then the rest doing it is really really easy. So that's the custom field, right? So that basically, in a nutshell, that took care of uh, what is a custom field, right? So, but some nuances that I want you to make you aware of. Once you create one, once you create the custom field, you cannot change it. You well, you can't change the type. You can rename it. But you can't change the type. So once you pick a dropdown, you can't all of a sudden make it a date type. 
that's not going to be possible. So you would have to delete it and recreate it. And uh, you want to do it quickly because if, if people start populating your fields with data, you're a goner at that point because now you're going to delete it from hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands of people. And uh, that's not good, right? So you want to be very, very careful and just know that it's probably just easiest to make a new one. Try to have a unique name because like we talked about with statuses and issue types, you do not, you do not want to have two fields that have the same name. That will... That is a recipe for disaster. <laughs> Trust me when I tell you, you do not want to have two fields with the exact same name. There's an advanced topic called the context, not in scope for this course, but uh, context is your savior when you want to do something similar. So just know that. Um, also, you cannot see the usage or utilization. You can see when it was last used. Um, let me go back to custom fields over here. So you can see when it was last used. It'll say last used here, but you don't know if it was actually used. Right, it just means that somebody used it. They could have done it accidentally, but you don't. Um, you can't see if it's actively being used. You can't see if it's like maybe somebody used it once and it's by by chance to, the dates pop populated. But you don't know if somebody's using it ten times a day, a hundred issues, or a thousand issues, or five thousand issues, right? Um, so that just keep that in mind because sometimes you're looking for um, again duplicative fields. You're looking for fields that are just to clean it up you're kind of shooting in the dark. So it's best to handle it at the beginning and just don't make unnecessary custom fields. And then finally, the duplicate fields, right? You want to be careful, use the context from there. Okay, and then to end this up, right? Uh, let's talk about screens, right? So uh, you notice that once I made my my field, right? Right now that I made my super awesome field, you'll notice that I was presented with, with the opportunity to put it on a screen. And so you're taken to this, to this view here and you're like, well, what the heck is a screen? So a screen is like a piece of paper and think of a field like just a line that you wrote on it, right? The, the screens hold your fields in the project and make it visible to the user. So if you, it's one thing to create the custom field, yay, it exists, it's in the pool. But if you want your user to use it in a specific project, then you need to put it on a screen. And now screens, there's a couple of complexities, right? As you can see here, there's a lot of screens in my in my view here. Uh, so let me go into the project because it's easier to view screens from the project. So if you go to the project settings of a project and you come over here on the left and you click on screens, you're going to be able to see the issue type screen scheme, the screen schemes, and the screens that are associated to any given project. Now, this is probably one of the hardest things about uh, screens and, and stuff, and it's not easy. And so in a second here, I'll give you some helpful tips and some next steps on how to proceed. But just know that from a beginner perspective, the fields go on the screen. And so if I wanted to use my super awesome field that I made, all I got to do is go into a screen, look it up down here and add it. And that's it. Now, when I hit the create button and I go down to the bottom, here's my super awesome field. It is now available. It's that simple. It is that easy to add a field to a screen. And that's it, right? Like that from a beginner perspective, that's all you got to know. But then there's the complexities of issue of, of the screen schemes. There's the complexities of the issue type screen scheme. There's the complexities of the operations. All of those a little bit more advanced and not enough time here to go into them in detail, especially since, again, as an admin, especially as a beginner, Adding a field to a screen is super easy. You go to the gear, you go to issues, you go to custom field, you click on this create custom field, you pick your type, right? I'm going to do super awesome, I can't spell awesome, date, and I can't spell anything apparently today, right? I do that, I hit create, I pick my screen, I put it where I want it. I don't know where I want it, I forgot the name. Jad, J J A J. There we go. I put it on the screen that I want. I hit update, and I'm done. That was it. From a beginner's perspective, my super awesome date is now at the bottom, and I can pick it. That is really really easy. That's all you need to know from a beginner's perspective. But uh, I I'm gonna take advantage of this opportunity to transition to, well, what about all the rest of this stuff with the screen schemes and the issue type screen schemes? Right. This is probably one. Uh, this is definitely not a beginner's uh, thing for you to know. Uh, this is a lot more advanced. So being able to manipulate the screen schemes and the issue type screen schemes takes a minute. It takes it takes a, a few trials and error. And so 
um, let me transition to what you should do if you want to continue down this issue type screen scheme, right? So um, on YouTube, right? And obviously, I'm going to promote here my own channel. But if you go to uh, Ape Tech and you put uh, screen scheme, um, you will be able to see this mastering uh, screen schemes and this how to configure screens and screen schemes. So check both of these out. These are going to be the videos that you want to watch if you want to fully understand and take that screen scheme to the next level. Because as I mentioned, from a beginner's perspective, I met my requirement. I showed you how to add a field to a screen. Super easy. But 99% of the time, you're going to be asked to do something a lot more complex. Again, not just not in scope for this class, right? So I want you to go check out these two videos. Um, I'll, I'm going to link them real quick. Uh, let me pause it. I'm going to link it in the chat here so you can check them out. Um, but if you're definitely curious and want to take those skills to the next level, check those out. So that's pretty much it at this point. I'm uh, going to pause this. Uh-oh. Oh, no, no, Monday, get away, get away, or click up, whatever that was. We don't want those ads on these videos because we love Jira. Okay, so with that said, uh, we made it to the end here. I got to drop here in a couple minutes. So how do you take your skills to the next level? First, subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. I'm Hopefully, I, I, earlier we, we crossed over 800. Uh, let's see how many more we got, the Jira Life. Uh, if you haven't subscribed, right, we got 812. So we got 70 people in here. So if you haven't subscribed to the channel, Take a second here to consider subscribing to the channel. Maybe we can get to 850 before this uh, in the next three minutes here. And so uh, make sure you do that. Scan the QR code here. Um, this will take you to links so that you can follow me on LinkedIn. Um, it'll have you links for my tech, uh, my Ape Tech, tech Tutorials channel. So if you want to see more of the technical videos, like the ones I just shared, you want to do that. Obviously, you're here on the Jira Live, so welcome. We talk about all things Jira all the time. We stream every single week, once a week, usually at 2 p.m. Uh, Pacific time. but Depending on our guest, we may change that around. So follow us. We have a profile on LinkedIn. Uh, Ronnie, I'm going to have to add that to my link tree. And I have free courses available on Salto. So if you want to do uh, board uh, administration, I have a free course on there. If you want to do like general Jura cleanup, tidy up your Jura, some helpful tips and tricks, I have a course on there completely free. Um, I have a full five-hour course. If you're if you're more not a Jura admin, but you're like a Jura user, I have a Jura for beginners uh, from an end user perspective, take that. I am working on a 12 hour Jira administration course. So that's going to be a full course or it's going to be about between 10 to 12 hours. So make sure you keep checking back um, that link tree, bookmark my link tree as, uh, as I'm going to have a lot of available content here for you very, very soon. And also if you want to just help support the channel, that link tree then has links to the merch store. We have some pretty cool, the Jira life uh, merch, uh, Ape Tech merch. Um, I'm not a bug. I'm not a story. I'm not a. I'm not an epic shirts. And so check them out. Pretty cool stuff up there. Uh, nerd out a little bit. Help support the channel. And um, that's pretty much it. So I'm gonna end it here. I'm gonna check and see if there's any questions uh, that need to be addressed real quick. But other than that, appreciate you coming here. Thank you so much for subscribing. Again, we're trying to get to a thousand subscribers, so we can't get there without your help. And so um, you take a second here to subscribe to the channel. That would be awesome. So can we? Can we have a session on Jira metrics and report sometime, please? Yes, absolutely. So I will take that feedback back to my my Atlassian handler, if you will, and uh, let them know that we we want some more trainings, more free trainings. All right, I think that was it. Um, advanced topic: When should we use screen tabs? Oh, definitely an advanced topic. So we we can definitely um, make sure we talk about that if we get a, a green light for a, a, a Jira advanced um, course. So, folks, with that said, thank you again very much. Um, connect with me on LinkedIn. Send me a message. Tell me you took the class because I have I get a lot of requests. So let me know that you took the class so I can accept that friend request. Or at least follow me. Um, post a lot of cool guides and tips and just a bunch of stuff. So if you want to, if you're new to the Alaskan community, uh, following myself, the Jira guy here who's on this call, definitely a good place to start. So with that said, thank you all very much. I'm going to end the stream. Don't forget to subscribe. And I'll see you hopefully next month. Bye.